Welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. Around 20 minutes packed with global news and analysis you won't find anywhere else. With me, Naomi Fowler. The TaxCast is available to everyone for download and broadcast on www.tackletaxhavens.com. Here's a quick quiz for you. As we've reported on the TaxCast, the UK government's planning a public register of the real owners of companies. Sounds great. Now have a guess how many out of 34 OECD member countries are failing to demand enough information in the first place? 27 out of 34 of them. And guess who's saying that? The OECD itself. And here's another one for you. The intergovernmental body, the Financial Action Task Force, has a series of recommendations on the identification of real owners. So, how many OECD countries does the OECD reckon are actually complying with them? Er, uh, none of them. Every year, at least $900 billion pours out of developing countries through illicit financial flows, mainly in the form of tax abuse by multinational corporations. Many of them are headquartered in Europe. That's according to a new report, giving with one hand and taking with the other. So called because more money is leaving developing countries than they're receiving in aid. The report says governments in 13 EU countries assessed are reluctant to implement transparency measures in which developing countries can actually participate. Figures also out this month from Global Financial Integrity say illicit financial flows from the world's poorest countries between 2001 and 2010 hit $5.8 trillion. And where is all that money going? Iceland has a different way of treating criminality in its banking sector to other countries. This month, four former bosses from the Icelandic bank Kaupfing were jailed for between three and five years. Compare that with US bank JP Morgan's latest settlement for its failure to protect the public and properly alert regulators about Bernard Madoff's Ponzi scheme fraud. No jail time for anyone, a deferred prosecution agreement and a $2 billion fine. After all the banking failures since the financial crisis, you'd think governments would be getting busy with proper legislation to deal with risk-taking, or out-and-out criminality. But no, tax lawyer Jack Bloom's seen it all and got the T-shirt. Just take a look at the recent financial crisis. And I have seen, in various cases I've been involved in, of the documentation that showed that what was going on was outright fraud. Yet no individual has been held accountable. There haven't been any prosecutions for the vast bulk of the fraud that occurred. And in this month's role of dishonour, the government of the Bahamas is proposing a VAT tax. And yes, it will disproportionately burden their poorest citizens, but someone's got to pay taxes to support their struggling economy. I'll be keeping an eye on that one on the tax cast. Credit Suisse, what a charming bank. Campaigners Global Witness recently exposed routine bulldozing of land belonging to local communities in Cambodia and Laos. They identified the Vietnamese rubber corporation they say is responsible. Just two weeks later, Credit Suisse became that company's largest institutional shareholder. And finally, Austria and Luxembourg are still blocking EU-wide agreements on transparency. This month, they told finance ministers, we won't agree to reforms until all the others do. That means until tax havens like Liechtenstein and Switzerland sign up. And then guess what Liechtenstein and Switzerland say? These pariah states have been playing this game for a long time. And the question the Tax Justice Network asks them is this. What kind of money are you banking that might be pulled out if you sign up to transparency measures? And that's this month's Roundup. Now we're going to talk to the Tax Justice Network's John Christensen for his take on this month. (laughs) 
right, John, this month the clock's ticking because at the end of this year, the end of this month, it's the legal deadline for Swiss banks to say whether or not they're going to cooperate with the United States' Foreign Accounts Transparency Compliance Act to report undeclared assets of US clients. What does the deadline mean, first of all? Swiss banks now face a year-end deadline to commit to cooperating with the US authorities on the Foreign Accounts Transparency Compliance Act, FATCA. Many Swiss banks appear unwilling to sign up to FATCA because the potential fines for the banks that sign up to FATCA are enormous, up to 50% of the assets involved. And even then, even if they sign up to FATCA, there are no assurances from the US that the banks will not face future lawsuits. But if they don't sign up, they must expect to be involved in years and years of conflict, and that will be dragged out as the US authorities continue to pursue non-cooperating banks. So there's every possibility that banks may refuse the deal and the political problems between the United States and Switzerland will drag on for many years. They're kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't, I guess. The Swiss banks face the dilemma in that other tax havens have already signed up to cooperate. For example, Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man have already signed up to cooperate. The Swiss banks are dragging their heels and If they don't sign up, there's no question that the US will use its extraordinary political power to drag out lawsuits and investigations, which could go on for many, many years. Moving on, we've had a bit of a tax justice win this month, haven't we? Uh, It may not be a total win, not quite as good as it appeared, but um, the Norwegian parliaments unanimously passed the introduction of country-by-country reporting for mining and forestry industries, but they've decided that they're going to uh, require these companies to report on investments, sale revenue, production volumes, purchases of goods and services, number of employees, but only from countries where they have actual production operations and not in the places where they might have uh, support functions, which actually also means tax havens and that they won't be included. So what on earth is going on there? When we heard the, the uh, initial report, we were, of course, very, very happy indeed. And then we read the small print and we discovered in the small print, or rather our colleagues in Norway who have been pushing for a long time, when we looked at the detail, companies which use tax havens for so-called support functions, and that might include consulting services, management services, and a whole host of other uh, intangible services, would not be required to produce country-by-country reports for these so-called support functions. And that, of course, means that there'll be a large loophole in this this reporting standard. But all is not lost, and all is not lost partly because, of course, once Norwegian civil society heard about this loophole, they started to raise a huge furore. The opposition to this loophole will be pushing for full country-by-country reporting. Now, why did this happen? Why did the current government, which is a newly elected Conservative government, allow this loophole? That's the big question. And one of the justifications they gave originally was that this was a measure to tackle corruption and not to tackle tax evasion. But civil society said, no, sorry, tax evasion must be seen as a corrupt activity And there was a little bit of a a backpedalling from the Norwegian government when they realised that civil society and within Parliament itself there was quite strong opposition. But what is clear is the government will be under enormous pressure to reverse this extraordinary loophole and to concede that country-by-country reporting will only work when you have full disclosure in all countries and to exclude tax havens is extraordinary and unjustifiable. Right, so we'll keep an eye on that one. Um, Let's just talk really quickly about the International Bar Association's report, Tax Abuse, Poverty and Human Rights. Interesting that they're deliberately referring to tax abuse and not tax avoidance and evasion anymore, because they're making it quite clear in this report that the justification that lawyers give that tax avoidance is technically legal isn't acceptable anymore if it means human rights violations come as a result. Tell me why this report really matters. 
This is the first step, I think, and a very, very important step in the direction of linking human rights to tax justice. And this is something which we expect to see build up in the coming year because there are other reports in the pipeline. Importantly, the United Nations Office of the Commission for Human Rights has itself commissioned a report on tax justice and human rights. So this is the first important report to come forward. And it's particularly useful, I think, that this report dismisses this long-standing argument that tax evasion is illegal and therefore not supportable, whereas tax avoidance is legal and therefore OK. And far too many companies, lawyers and bankers have been hiding behind this weasel term tax avoidance for a very long time. The end result, as Tax Justice Network has argued for many years, has been that whether it's tax evasion or tax avoidance is not material because many countries are losing huge amounts of revenue which they desperately need. And they desperately need that revenue partly to meet their human rights commitments, to deliver shelter, improve water and education and health services. Frankly, without those revenues, commitments to human rights can't be delivered on. Thanks, John. John Christensen, Director of the Tax Justice Network. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. When companies and wealthy individuals don't pay their taxes, it means it's harder for governments to provide the things we're supposed to have a human right to, like the right to water, sanitation, education, security, an adequate standard of living, shelter, food and health care. This month, the TaxCast looks at tax, human rights and the role of lawyers. We ask the question, how long can they continue doing business as usual? When I went to law school, I was taught that my job as a lawyer was to teach my clients how to obey the law. Not how to avoid the law, how to obey it. Veteran lawyer and economic crime investigator Jack Bloom at a recent conference on tax and human rights. My job was to keep them clear of that zone of doubt that is between clearly legal and clearly illegal. What really becomes problematic is when that kind of counseling spreads past the law of my country or my jurisdiction and begins to be an international issue. And now suddenly am I free of that obligation to teach people how to obey the law of other countries? Well, many of my colleagues feel absolutely. Of course they're free, because now they're not obligated to tell people how to stay legal in other places. Moreover, they view their job as how to navigate and arbitrage the rules of one jurisdiction against the rules of another. And even worse, go to various jurisdictions and write laws that create the possibility of cheating on tax. So I will tell you that the laws of virtually every tax haven were written by some law firm in London, New York, or you pick the place. And what slot bucket did those lawyers put their ethics into? Where is the personal responsibility for the poverty and the pain inflicted by the failure of a tax system globally that enables companies to pay zero tax even when the rates and the stated rates are high? It's a very good question, because so far lawyers have escaped scrutiny of their role in helping multinational corporations take advantage of the global structure we have today. Lawyers are helping their clients set up a subsidiary here, another subsidiary there, move the company's money around and no one can follow the trail. So how do we navigate our way around all this complexity to connect tax avoidance and human rights? Dr Atiyah Waris of Nairobi University has been researching the connection. When you're evading taxes, you're deliberately breaking the law. But when you're avoiding the taxes, you are immorally reinterpreting the law in order to reduce your tax burden. So abuse covers both the illegal and the immoral. Human rights are conceptualized as being universal, inalienable. You cannot separate it from a person. Indivisible, that you get the whole bucket of them. Freedom of association, the right to vote. You also get the right to food, so they all come together. 
all states have actually signed on to treaties that are like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. They signed on to the International Covenants, they signed on to African Charters on Human Rights, for example. So once they've signed it, they've taken on the responsibility. The same way as though they signed a bilateral trade agreement and agreed to allow South Korea to come and set up businesses in Rwanda, for example. Why are some better enforced than others? The people who fight for the connection between tax and human rights argue that rights require resources. There isn't a single international treaty right now, these are the ones in human rights, that actually recognizes the need for financial resources. It's simply not there. That simple phrase is actually not there. So there's work to be done on what seems to be a mixture of largely unenforced and perhaps even unenforceable voluntary agreements and commitments. But connecting human rights and tax isn't just about hard law, and I'll come back to that. But if you had any doubts about the link between human rights and tax, here's an interesting example of how increased tax revenue can directly facilitate the provision of services that fulfil a nation-state's human rights treaty agreements. Here's Savia Mbwamwa of the Centre for Trade Policy and Development in Zambia. Recently, the government announced changes to the tax regime of the mining sector. It doubled the minority tax, and part of the expenditure where that increased revenue was going to, on the social services side, they announced that they're going to be providing free education up to a certain level and free Medicare for people who can't afford, for, for young children and for women. Also, the government of Zambia is now pushing a decentralization program which would ensure that the services are brought closer to where they're most needed. All these policy programs, all these social services need extra money and the government made it clear that it's the new tax changes that will allow government to raise this sort of money. And this isn't something that only affects the world's poorer countries. In Europe, people are still experiencing an economic crisis that's seen governments cut essential services. Corporations are avoiding billions in tax that could have been enough to make those cuts unnecessary. But let's get back to the lawyer's role as part of the enabler industry for tax avoidance. Or, as the International Bar Association now prefers to call it, tax abuse. Lawyer Jack Bloom. We have one hell of a problem because the legal system is not holding the lawyers accountable, not holding the corporations accountable, and the consequence of this is the poorest people in the world subsidize the richest people in the world, asking those poor people to pay for the privilege of working in a factory that doesn't pay tax in their country. What is your responsibility as a lawyer when you sit down and write laws for a place like the Republic of Nauru? or the Cayman Islands, or Panama, or the corporate law of the British Virgin Islands. I've actually represented, at one point, the Republic of Nauru, which had 9,500 citizens, a member of the United Nations, began chartering banks for the Russian Mafia. And where was that law written that allowed that kind of chartering of banks? in Washington, D.C. by some lawyers three blocks from mine. It's the human rights community that now has to turn that around and say, wait a minute, there is a responsibility, there is a social responsibility, and you are going to be accountable somewhere. And the question we have to ask is, where is the space for that accountability? And how do we create real potential for enforcement? How indeed. And that's now the focus of a lot of research. But it's not just a case of hard law. It's about changing business cultures too. Adrienne Margulis of Lawyers for Better Business. The law can often have unintended consequences. And often you see laws that just reflect what corporations would like them to say because of their ability to sort of lobby 
governments and other organisations. We're still at a level of a lot of lawyers when it comes to tax justice saying, what's this got to do with me? One of their roles is actually to give corporations advice beyond just the narrow legal advice on things like reputational damage, risk management, then you've got a starting point from which you can talk about things like their social license to operate and their obligations beyond what the narrow confines of the law in any one country might say. A lot of certainly NGOs, when it came to the business and human rights framework, which was adopted by the UN in 2012, were very concerned about the fact that it's voluntary, as is, for example, the UN Global Compact, which has got thousands of companies who sign up to operating in all these kinds of ways. And I think law actually comes from a set of society's values and norms. And to that extent, I see the things that the UN are doing or the things that are being discussed that are being done voluntarily as as steps down a path. And in some cases, it would help to have something in an actual legal framework. It's not impossible to get this done, to get some things in law. But I think with others, you might not actually need the law to achieve what you want to achieve. And one of the things to do is to think of what's called a smart mix about where you need law and where you don't and where there are other ways that you could achieve something similar. As far as guidance on good practice for lawyers is concerned, the International Bar Association's now clear. In their recent report, Tax Abuses, Poverty and Human Rights, they say, the fact that tax strategies that produce unfair results may be technically legal is no longer a sufficient justification for their continued use. And they also say, Merely complying with tax law is not enough when this results in the violation of human rights. So here's some questions for lawyers to ponder. Might we be on our way towards the first test cases in this area? How long before campaigners start naming and shaming the enablers of tax abuse? And how long before the swanky law firm offices of top lawyers in Washington, D.C. and London find themselves the focus of protests? You've been listening to The Taxcast from the Tax Justice Network. For more Taxcasts, go to www.tackletaxhavens.com and for more information on tax justice worldwide, go to www.taxjustice.blogspot.com We'll be back on the Taxcast next month.